Welcome to day 15 of our 30 days to Christian meditation retreat. Here we are at the end of week two. Today, it's putting it all together with asceticism. So we've been looking at dispositions and principles this week, how we grow in our interior life. You know, that's that goal, that growth, that spiritual growth. And it's a curious thing that in our spiritual life, we grow by becoming small so that God can be big. So how do we become small? That is the role of asceticism. So let's begin in prayer in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, make of me a fitting dwelling place for the Lord. Amen, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Well, thank you for being a part of this retreat. Thank you for making this time for the Lord. And here we are at the end of week two. And always at the end of each week, we, we, we want to pull everything together. And that doesn't mean rehashing what we did all week long. No one needs to, to hear that. But just uh, crystallizing it, looking at it from maybe a little different perspective and, and seeing how it all fits into the bigger picture of our spiritual life. As a very brief recap, again, this week we looked at dispositions and principles. Dispositions, these are focused on, on us, the characteristics of, of our mind, our heart, yeah, how we reform our nature that is particularly beneficial to our spiritual growth. The ones we looked at were faith, trust, purity of intention, humility, and fortitude faith and trust, relying totally on, on God, and always turning to him, purity of intention and humility, you know, you're with us becoming pure, becoming small, and that fortitude that we have to, because we still have to bring the best of ourselves that we can. God provides that grace. He always initiates, but we need to do our part, and fortitude is a big a big part of that and to persevere when the, the challenges come and the challenges always come. And then our principles, really looking at the three persons of the Trinity. The first principle, God the Father, the, the primacy of God, the initiative. It's always God taking that initiative. And we looked at the, the law of love that goes hand in hand with that. Our response to God's initiative, our response to God's love is to let him love us. And that's where that trust comes in, the trust in his goodness. We look at the incarnation, the second principle, looking at the son, that incarnation, that, that is where God desires to have that personal relationship with us. It's just that all important that we meet God there, because then it's through the son that he reunites us, he redeems us and brings us back to the father through the Holy Spirit, the third principle. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit, Jesus told us, it's better that I leave because he was external to us. He wants to be, be internal, interior with us, our interior life. That is why God breathed his spirit into us in the first place. That's why we're created with a spiritual soul. So we have that unique place, piece of our being where, where we can literally commune with God. So those three principles, how we relate to the three persons of the Trinity we're going to sum things up this week by looking at asceticism, which asceticism is a, a practice, discipline, you know, part of our, our devotional life that is a perfect complement to these principles and dispositions. You know, first, you know, we hear asceticism, we think of, the, again, the Monty Python skits and people going around, you know, whipping themselves, or we think of being forced to sit through the movie Ishtar. Maybe more positively, we'll think of the words of St. Paul when he says, we need to compete well in this life. You know, he likens it to an athlete. He says how athletes deprive themselves of all manner of things, and they're temporary things, and, and they do that simply for a crown that fades. He is talking directly to asceticism. That's where we see it very clearly spelled out in the New Testament. Now, traditionally, asceticism, when we look at our three ages of the interior life, the purgative, illuminative, unitive, asceticism has been associated with the first two ages, purgative and illuminative, where we're really 
purifying ourselves, we're purging ourselves of those unneeded and harmful attachments and, and growing in holiness. And then mysticism has been associated with that third age, the unity of where we enter into mystical union, which is why uh, spiritual theology is often referred to as ascetical and mystical theology. Oftentimes, the two are just generally combined together. As we've also said, it's not as if we just cross some invisible line and, okay, I'm, I'm no longer leaving, leaving an ascetical life. You know, now, now I'm a mystic. Yeah, it's all along a spectrum. And the great mystics, they carry those ascetical practices right through with them. People entering into an ascetical life which we'll look at in a moment here, they're already taking a step along that mystic path. So you know, they go hand in hand. But just where these terms come from, here are some other definitions of asceticism. This is from Adolf Tanqueray, where he says, it is the science of spiritual perfection. And the Catechism of the Catholic Church defines it as the practice of penance, mortification, and self-denial to promote greater self-mastery and to foster the way of perfection by embracing the way of the cross. And the ascetical wisdom, very much from the Eastern side of the church, if we look to the desert fathers, that, that was very much a part of going out into the desert to separate from the world the worldly allurements for that um, place of self-mastery in, in the Greek tradition. You look at Saints, uh, St. John Chrysostom, St. Basil, St. John Cassian, Pseudo Dionysius, these early patriarchs from the third, fourth, and fifth century. Uh, that's where they, they really opened up the, the beauty and the power of this as part of spiritual warfare, of, of combating the evil, particularly within in ourself. And, it's certainly always been a part of the Christian tradition. And that is where we find a lot of the formal writings, the overall concepts of it and mindset of self-denial, self-mastery, achieving true freedom. It's always been, been part of our heritage. So let's start with a very practical look at asceticism and, and where it fits into our life. Let's start with our jungle mission, when in doubt. At the beginning of our jungle mission, we're going to have to wean ourselves from all manner of things that we'd become accustomed to. When we go out in the jungle, um, we're not going to have the, the usual comforts of ordinary life. We're not going to have internet. We're not going to have screens of any sort. We're not going to have television, you know, phones. You know, we're making up our own rules here. So in the jungle we're going into, there aren't going to be generators. There aren't going to be cell phone towers. So that's going to go. There aren't going to be refrigerators. There isn't going to be convenience stores. There isn't going to be carry out. That's going to go. There aren't going to be gyms and spas. That's going to go. There aren't going to be sports stadiums. That's going to go. Yeah, all of these ordinary diversions and entertainment and sources of pleasure are not going to be with us out in the jungle. And it's going to be difficult going if we have to do all of that cold turkey the second that we're out there on a mission. So it's going to behoove us, especially as we're preparing for the jungle mission, to start weaning ourselves from these things. But notice it, it's not a fruitless emptying and as we get rid of that and then, okay, that's it. You know, now we're going to go into the jungle and just be miserable. No, far from it. The, the jungle is going to bring with it a tremendous reward, if you will, and benefit, great fruitfulness in the jungle. We're going to see sights firsthand, the likes of which we, we've never seen. It's never the same on a small screen. In fact, all of its sights, sounds, very rare to hear an actual lion's roar. Most people go their entire life, you can go sit in a zoo as long as you want. You're not going to hear a lion let out a full-throated roar in the zoo. The sights, the smells, 
our own personal experiences. We're going to discover parts of ourselves. We're going to discover uh, abilities, capacities that we would have never known we would have otherwise. Our ability to help others. You know, we're not out there just on our own in this jungle mission. Many other people are, are also taking the same journey, our, our ability to help them along the way. And then, of course, our guides, our three guides, the three persons of the Trinity. You know, imagine if you were doing any other undertaking with whoever is your greatest hero, whoever you would most desire to do something with. And just like that, you were able to do it. And not only were you able to do it, but they were completely completely focused on you. They were there as your personal cheerleader, just constantly looking out for you, desiring the best for you, telling you how much they thought of you, how much they desired for you. Well, that's, that's what we get to do with our three guides on this mission. So again, it is not a, a fruitless emptying that we're doing, preparing for our jungle mission, you know, learning to rid ourselves of these other attachments and many times distractions of life, it's getting rid of that. So we can really give ourselves fully to these even greater experiences, this greater reality, this greater fruitfulness of our time in the jungle. Okay, now we wanna look at the you know, two broad approaches that we have in our spiritual development. First, in looking at what we were doing earlier in this week, we have the dispositions and principles yeah, how we really kind of fill ourselves with with God and with holy things, with good holy um, virtues, you know, those dispositions of our soul. We fill ourselves in these relationships with the Trinity. Now, recall as we were going through these topics, we often talked about the enemy, the role of the enemy, which is really three: again, our self, the world, the devil, and and his minions. And how they're always there, always there, chipping away at us, how counter they are. You know, it's really their counter when we look at, at our dispositions, how you know, fear, that great enemy of trust and the pride, that great enemy of humility and purity of intention, or how we need fortitude to overcome these and overcome just the kind of the, the boredom, the fatigue that can tend to set in and, and take us off course. And likewise, when we're looking at the principles, our relationship with the Trinity, you know, much of that, again, is growing in that relationship with, with God. So we, we won't get pulled off course by these other allurements, these enemies. So this side of things, this approach of you know, growing in relationship with God, filling ourselves with these good dispositions, good virtues and habits, behaviors, it also naturally helps to push back against the enemy. As we grow in humility, it will naturally repress pride, but it's in a secondary way. Now we have a, a more active, a, a more direct approach to doing battle, and that is through asceticism. And first, we have to understand when we're talking about the enemies, it's not all equal for us and how we engage them. We have to recognize there's really very little that we can do about the world. The world is fallen and will be until Christ's return. And Satan himself is beyond redemption. That's a lost cause. So there's very little we can do to put a dent in those aspects of the enemy. But what we can do and what is directly accessible to us is our own fallen nature. And that's great news because it turns out our fallen nature is actually our greatest enemy. You know, when we make headway there, we're making the best headway we can. Here uh, from two particular saints, St. John Cassian, no one is more my enemy than my own heart, which is the one of the household closest to me. And very similar to him, St. Bernard, the enemy that dwells within us is the same house. And very similar from St. Uh, Bernard, the enemy that dwells with us in the same house injures us most. And they're just building on St. Paul here, you know, when he's talking about his own battles against the old man, as he puts it. 
through asceticism, we, we do battle against sometimes called our, our false self and our attachments to things that are unhealthy and draw us from God. And a tremendous thing happens when we do this because then we are actually doing the best things that we can to respond to the world and Satan. Because as we purify ourselves, as we rid ourselves of these attachments, the allurements of the world are no longer alluring. They, they don't hook us and pull us in. And we take away those strongholds in our own heart and our own personality, our, our own fallen self, where otherwise Satan gets in and, and he, he, he worms his way in with his lies and deceptions. So by purifying ourselves, we naturally minimize you know, the, the damage, if you will, that the, the world that Satan can do. And that is that beauty of it. as we get small, as we get rid of all of this lower and disordered part of ourself. That is when we start making more and more room for the other side of things as we're filling ourselves then with God, as we're filling ourselves with um, good virtuous habits and acts of charity towards our neighbor. And this is now where we have this two, two pronged approach, if you will, for, for how we grow. It's where asceticism fits in. Here, it's also very important now that we emphasize that asceticism is for everyone. So first we see how asceticism fits in, that we have these two approaches, one where we're growing and, and filling ourselves with good things, and asceticism is how we draw down and rid ourselves of the bad. Now, again, we have to be clear, asceticism, it is for every human being, because we all suffer for this, from the same effects of the fall. Asceticism isn't just for some special class of, of monks and cloistered nuns. Yeah, they're the only ones who get to be holy, and the rest of us just have to grind it out in this life, just enslaved by our fallen nature. Who wants that? Uh, everybody wants to be free. I know the path to freedom can be difficult, but everybody desires freedom. But even more, that freedom is actually just a byproduct. And we should first and foremost desire this just because it's what God desires for us. And if God desires it for us, that that's, should be good enough. That's, again, that trust and that purity of intention. Okay, so how do we know that this is what God wants for us and for all of us, that it's meant for every human being? Well, first, Christ says, whoever would follow after me must deny himself. Period. There's no other qualification. It's not just, oh, any priests and nuns that would follow after me must deny themselves and everyone else gets a free pass or everyone else just has to, again, suffer through this life a slave to their passions. No, just whoever's going to follow me, you got to deny yourself. St. Paul, he just he tells us that the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit lusts against the flesh, period, for everybody. We're all in that tank together. St. John Chrysostom, and, and he was responding to, even back in his day, going back over a millennia, this very unhealthy idea of divergence, that there is you know, some separate class of spiritual elite, and everyone else just could go about their life as is. He says, you greatly delude yourself into air if you think that one thing is demanded from the layman and another from the monk because all must rise to the same height. And what has turned the world upside down is that we think only the monk must live rigorously while the rest are allowed to live a life of indolence. Is, you know, how uncharitable is that yeah, for all the rest of us? If that's the message, yeah, you, you all just go about your business. No, now, the way we live out asceticism may look a little bit different, not a lot different, frankly, a little bit different, but we're all called to this. We're all called to the freedom that comes from it. The point is that we all suffer from the same disease. We all suffer that same wound, that same damage from original sin. St. Paul words it as this principle that he sees in himself. There's that word principle. This is a negative principle. You know, our principles, they're positive principles of trust and faith and humility. He sees a negative principle that I 
don't do the good I wish and I do the evil I do not wish. And we're, we're all there. We all have that same principle that's part of our fallen nature, but we can overcome it. And we can overcome it again because Jesus says so, because he says, the truth will set you free. Jesus is the truth. We just have to turn to him. We have to turn to that truth. We attach ourselves to it, and then we're free. That is what he desires for us. But we can't attach ourselves, unite ourselves to Christ if we're still clinging, clinging on to this fallen nature. They have to go hand in hand. Again, these two approaches so beautifully made it together. This is this is what is being spelled out in the New Testament. So you know, here we have it. We we fill ourselves up with the dispositions, the principles, these good good practices. We empty ourselves of our fallen self through asceticism and through the two of these together. And then we are, are free, available to unite ourselves to Christ so he can do his good work in us. So asceticism is a great gift. It's not just that cartoonish, Yamanchi Python, uh, miserable. And it's a great gift because of that word freedom that we were just talking about. We say God created us with our spiritual soul so we could commune with him. My heart is restless until it rests in the deep calling on deep. Our only true satisfaction and joy in this life and in the next comes from God. The problem is because of the fall, we look to satisfy that longing with other things with low and earthly things, looking for love in all the wrong places. And it, it is just part of that fall because the devil is as low as, as it comes. He's always looking to substitute these very cheap imitations. We, we look for that satisfaction in ease and comfort and pleasure. Now, as we say repeatedly, mind you, this looks different for everybody. The workaholic is still seeking comfort and ease. For the workaholic, it looks like working 20 hours a day. Many people would look at that and say, that's not comfort, that's not ease, and the world might hold that up. Look at that discipline, look at that achievement. But that is, for someone with that kind of disordered disposition, that is comfort and ease. It's the comfort and ease that comes from that ready fulfillment, that worldly fulfillment that comes, but probably at the expense of other things that they're called to. Now, I'm, I'm not picking on workaholics. There's always the usual disclaimer here. And there's nothing wrong with hard work. The saints were tremendously hard workers, but they were workers in the vineyard. It was ordered to God. Everything has to be ordered to God. And so each of us, it doesn't matter you know, who we are. We all have that same basic wound that we look to satisfy ourselves with things other than the Lord, with low and earthly things that distract us from God, that take us into ourself. Each of us, each of us have our own brand of this and generally tied to the seven deadly sins or vices, pride, lust, envy, anger, greed, gluttony. And yet these are the things that drag us off track. And then what are the kinds of things that we say, you know, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm just powerless in, in, in the face of it. I just, I get dragged into what, what have you. And through the world it, and the enemy, the ultimate enemy, Satan, they are very happy to keep us enslaved there and give us all those, you know, just platitudes, you know, oh, you know, I am who I am. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to change. It's all good. I'm not hurting anyone. Other people are doing it. You name it. They are more than happy to keep us there. And that's not freedom. It's not freedom at all when we can't you know, look at a member of the opposite sex without lust when we can't walk by a refrigerator or a dessert bar without gluttony, when we can't enter into a conversation without it turning into you know, gossip or envy, whatever it may be, wherever we, we fall, and we're just a slave to this. And then what happens? Yeah, we feel bad about ourselves. 
even if it's something that we somehow concoct to be a good thing deep down our soul is being damaged every time true freedom is when we are free to say no absolutely to anything that's objectively evil and then when we can take it or leave it with the other things they don't have power over us yeah i have dessert i don't have dessert i have a donut i don't have a donut I, you know i enjoy it that's fine and i move on it doesn't have that power that I have one donut i have to have five more that is true freedom the opposite i'm sure you know is is license and we just feel we can do whatever we want that leads to enslavement so that power to say no to it whatever that it is for you that is freedom and that is again what asceticism brings that power to just say no and turn from those things that are otherwise going to drag us down so let's look very specifically at how asceticism works again first the goal of asceticism is to destroy that false self or what saint paul calls the old man or what psychology would refer to as the ego and this is that part of us that comes up when we're operating from our pride the i know best part of ourself i know best how to plan for my future i know best how to help my neighbor i know best how to arrange for my own leisure and entertainment and on and on when we just look directly to the i and we're driving things rather than starting with God. Yes, we're always then called on to use our own God-given intellect to collaborate with God, but it, it has to be led by him. It starts with God. Everything starts with God. We do it in the company of God. We complete it with God. And we're just doing our part then to respond remember this is the, the first principle okay god is always taking that initiative and we have to keep giving that over to him and now instead of the i know best it's the god knows best and i'm going to do that out of love for god and neighbor but instead we're always so quick to push god aside anytime he's getting in the way of where we want to start going our way we push god aside and do our will through asceticism we push ourself aside so that we can do God's will. Now, as always, I know a lot or all of this may be familiar ground to you, but we just go through these things always step by step just for completeness. So in asceticism, then it's really quite simple. The masters uh, that are taught on this subject, they'll always distinguish between two passions and drives that we have the interior and the exterior or internal and external and we look at interior mortification and exterior mortification and by mortification means to subdue these desires basically we're going to choke them off and with the exterior those things that are driven by exterior temptations things that we see as good but they, they become false goods for us and the, the two main ones are gluttony and lust then the interior are driven by our interior senses and passions. And so this is where we get taken off track with anger, with greed, with envy, sloth. So again, we mortify ourselves by choking off, choking off uh, the oxygen to these disordered desires. Let's take a simple example. We'll go with gluttony because all of us suffer from gluttony to, to one degree or another. And if, if nothing else, gluttony is just an, an, an overall preoccupation with food. And, and come on, you know, just look around, look at all the choices that we have. And then we're still not satisfied. I, you know, we can go and get 30 different kinds of, of frozen pizza. And we still don't like the, the one that we end up with or we're, we're fussy about it. One way or another, we all have that. And so let's say that that's an area where we want to start and we, we want to mortify that. We want to purify that. Well, it's very much in the same vein as we would enter into Lenten observance. And, and we all know ourselves well enough. I'm certainly when in doubt, you can go back to prayer and bring this to your time meditation, at least for getting a start. The Lord has revealed enough about ourselves to ourselves that we can guess where we're going to start. So let's say it is dessert and we decide, you know what? I'm going to start to just mortify 
that little disordered aspect I have with gluttony. I'm, I'm going to give up dessert. You want to start very small always. You don't have to give up dessert every day. One or two days a week, Wednesday and Friday, I'm going to give up dessert. And we start there. And then you know, we need to do is stick with it. Now, here's where our principles come in. You know, we start with faith and trust. You know, we trust that God is who he says he is, that this is good for us to do. And we do it for no other reason that God tells us to, and that he's working good from it, whether we're feeling that good coming or not at the moment. So we step into it in faith and in trust, priority of intention. Now, we're not doing it to get something out. So yeah, I, I'm giving up my dessert for a month now, and I haven't seen that miracle. I'm waiting for that miracle in my life, or I'm going back to dessert seven days a week. No, the purity of intention. I'm doing this first and foremost out of love for God, my desire to grow closer to him, and entrust that this is part of my path to grow closer to him. In humility, I recognize I can do nothing without God, even something as simple as giving up dessert a couple of times a week, that it's always initiated by God's grace, always initiated. Any good thing that I can do starts with God. Now, the flip side of that, though, is that I do then have to respond to that and do my part, bring my will to it. That's where fortitude comes in, okay? Because the ascetical practices, the, these are spiritual practices. So our principles are, are perfectly suited to helping us grow in asceticism. So they're just a simple example of an ascetical practice for our exterior drives. The same would hold true for interior. Let's say we're given to anger and we just we recognize that about ourselves. Well, we take a look. Is there anything in particular that tends to arouse our anger? Is there something that we just naturally become frustrated with in, in others, in situations, in work, whatever it would be? And we identify that what is just a small change that I can make in my life to start to mortify that. And again, when in doubt, you bring these to prayer and you bring it trustingly to prayer. I'm going to spend time with the Holy Spirit. My next time meditation, I'll bring this to the Lord, bring this to the Holy Spirit. And you, we may not hear bells coming off. We may not have God write on a stone tablet. Thou shalt not talk to Bob at the water cooler about politics tomorrow. It may be very much just us reflecting on this, but in the presence of the Holy Spirit. And then we have great confidence in what we come up with from that time. Okay, I prayed with this. I brought my intellect to it, but I offered all this to the Lord. And and my sense is that this is what I should do. This is where I should start to mortify my anger. And then we, we move forward. We move forward in great trust, in great humility, in great fortitude. And we keep going with it until God redirects us. God will then show us, you know, if we're choosing well, if we're doing well, we'll get that small inspiration to add a little bit more to it over time or maybe redirect it. But we let God always be the one in charge of this. And as always, as we talked about before, it is very important that um, the mortifications that we choose, that they're very small, very achievable, because it's always backsliding in the spiritual life is just very counterproductive because we have those three enemies that are always ready to pounce. The second we have any any back step, they're ready to leap in. That being said, inevitably it happens. Inevitably we fall and stumble. One donut becomes five, whatever it may be. We seek forgiveness, ideally in the fullness of reconciliation, the sacrament of reconciliation, and we move ahead. God tells us that make all things new. We start fresh. We start with great trust, with great fortitude. If need be, we can maybe even with a slightly smaller mortification. We just make sure that it is achievable and we keep keep going. And it's extremely empowering. I'm sure you've experienced this in some aspects of life. Once we gain just that little bit of self-mastery and see, I can do this. By God's grace, I can do this. It, it 
it overflows into other parts of our life and we gain momentum. Now, it, it is always that one last point we have to take great care of, of recognizing it's by God's grace because the, <laughs> the enemy uh, is always, always bound and determined to to twist and distort any good thing. And so what will happen is even if, if we're successful and we prevail in our mortification, the enemy, his final effort to snatch his victory um, and turn it into our defeat is to turn it to spiritual pride. Look at what I just did. Look at how great I am. Uh, you know, and, and now I've just taken two steps back. So always remembering it's it's done by God. It's done for God's glory. We get all the benefits then. We get the, the peace. We get the self-mastery. We get that satisfaction of participating in in working out our salvation and then becoming more available to God, more available to others. People start seeing a change in us in a positive way. We just take that as a consolation. Wow, yeah, someone just gave me a nice compliment. I, I guess this really is starting to take effect to change who I am. So that is asceticism in practice. Very beautiful, very powerful, very freeing. So in closing, asceticism is the perfect complement to our dispositions and our principles, you know, in our dispositions, which are those positive, positive behaviors, positive virtues. We, we want to get rid of those dark sides of our nature where we're given to vice and sin so that we're then you know, free and really able to just take off and grow in the positive virtues. And then it also makes just room in our life, room in our existence for God to become very big because we get rid of those attachments. We're not constantly seeking distraction and pleasure and ease in the things of the world. Instead, we're looking to God for that and trusting that he'll provide. He, he knows when we need relaxation and refreshment, he'll take care of all that. We're putting all of that in his hands. And so we're growing in that relationship. A few last quotes, if we need any more motivation, but uh, for completeness, as we close out, this is from Second Peter. He has bestowed on us the precious and very great promises so that through them you may come to share in the divine nature after escaping from the corruption that is in the world because of evil desire. See, we share in divine nature after we escape from the corruption of the world. And asceticism is a part of that. And here from 1 Corinthians, but whoever is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Whoever is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Asceticism is our path to being joined to the Lord and being one spirit with him. This leads perfectly into these final words of Christ. It's not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, that will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. And this is how we get to that point. This is how we get to that point through God's grace where we're just naturally living in the center of the will of the Father, where we're naturally joined to the Spirit of Christ. Asceticism is just such a beautiful, tremendous gift that we're given for how we bring the best of ourselves to that. So uh, again, thank you so much for uh, being with us through these first two weeks. Let's close in prayer. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus Christ, help me to be ever more aware of your great nearness, your great love for me. I love you. Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. I look forward to being with you again tomorrow.